So this is the city of Oman in the far distance. Moses was buried somewhere in this range of mountains here. He is Mount Nebo. This is where Moses saw the promised land from. You see the Dead Sea down there. On the very skyline of the mountains today, we can actually see the city of Jerusalem, the Mount of Olives. Uh, the city across there is Jericho. Again, uh, this is the view from the top of Mount Nebo where Moses was. Here we are on the top of Mount Nebo. This stone was used to roll in front of the door of the church. Again, it wouldn't have quite been this big, but the stone at the garden tomb would have been uh, like this. In these hills here is where Petra is. The valley that you're looking at is Israel. And the mountains on the far side are the mountains of Israel. And again, as the Bible talks in the book of Revelation about the children of Israel fleeing to the mountains, uh, and Jesus would say the same thing, this is the only place where it really makes sense, where they could travel from Israel over here to mountains. The mountains of Moab, Jordan, Petra. Petra is, uh, is the rock. The Hebrew word for it is safe. Beginning to go down into the Seek, into Petra, this amazing city. Here we are walking uh, in the Seek. It was a small crack, but when the Nabataeans came here, they started to make it wider. They started to widen it up. You can see the marks in their work. She's got a hammer right here. So it's apparent that the road was really narrow. They made it wider. They added two water channels, one to the left, as you see. One to the right side, but we're, we're not going to see part of it now. We are. Here's our picture. <laughs> Here we are still going down the seat. It means that the sound Here's stone itself is moist. You see, it keeps, tree. Yeah, it keeps the water inside it. Well, the, Every time there's like a the small one and cause a flash flood. They carry that. They build dams to hold water. Here's the seek, and look how high up it goes. Here's the Roman road when the Romans had this. And looking up, the highest point is 300 feet. That would be like 30 stories. Look how narrow it is up at the top, which means they carved this out to make it wider down here. This is just. Absolutely breathtakingly beautiful. Hi, say hi! You see the Roman road that dates back. Look at all the beautiful colors here in the sea. It's just gorgeous. Yellow, rosy. See different colors. Depending on how much iron do I have inside the rock. Amazing. The foliage is growing here. Again, they built another dam, but look at the beautiful color. Here's the seek. Look how narrow and tall. Again, the water channel from water. The amphitheater here in Petra. Amazing. Now, were they well-to-do people? Exactly. Uh, this is what makes this amphitheater unique. It was totally carved out. It was solid rock. These are the royal tombs. for important people. Tombs of important people. As you see, Major League. Look at the spectacular colors. Doesn't even look real. Look at this rock here. It looks like a piece of salmon. That's what I showed you on the right, map, you yes. see? So that's the la last site there, the Daughter's Palace, or what's remained of it. Yes. Plus, it's not for an Abatean uh, person. Right. How are you doing, Norma? Right. Getting ready for your camel ride? Yep. Whoop, there you go. So here we are riding camels in Petra. <laughs> There we go. This is what you call a real camel ride. This takes you back in time. Riding a camel through Petra. Oh yes. It's 
for this was the Roman Cardo. And there's the Roman gate down there. And look at that mountain right in between. It looks like a camel. You have to get this cell phone on a camel. Here we are at the end. The monastery is on the top. And this is the Princess Palace. And this was the city center. And there again, you can see the camel in the rock. Well, good morning, friends. I'm here in the Sikh in Petra. As you can see, this great canyon that comes in. This was the entrance to the ancient city of Petra, the red rose city that's half as old as time. Petra, its Bible name is Sila, means rock. Petra is a Greek word for, for rock. And uh, it has been the, a great city throughout history. It was founded by the Edomites. Esau, after his uh, departure from Jacob, and the Edomites then became enemies of Israel throughout the Bible. After the Edomites was the Nabataeans. The Greeks were also here when Alexander the Great came. The Romans were here. The Egyptians were here. It was, this is on the crossroads of Africa, Asia, Europe. Uh, it is an amazing, amazing place that has a place in the Bible all the way through. Well, again, here we are in the Sikh of Petra. If you'll notice, this is a statue that was once carved out of a man leading a camel. Right here, you can see the camel's feet. And everything else is gone, but there's a series of camels with this man here. What's amazing, what we can see left of him, he has a Roman toga on, he has Greek sandals, he's carrying an African stick, and who knows what else up above. But it shows you what a cosmopolitan city this was in the trade between Europe and Asia and Africa. But where we begin in the Bible is Numbers chapter 20. In verse number 14, Now Moses sent messengers from Kadesh to the king of Edom. Thus says your brother Israel, you know all the hardship that has befallen us. How our fathers went down to Egypt. We dwelt in Egypt a long time and the Egyptians afflicted us and our fathers. And we cried out to the Lord and he heard our voice and sent the angel and brought us up out of Egypt. Now here we are in Kadesh, a city on the edge of your border. Please let us pass through your country. We will not pass through fields or vineyards, nor will we drink water from your wells. We'll go along the king's highway. And the king's highway leads right here to Petra. We will not turn aside to the right hand or the left until we have passed through your territory. Then Edom, and again Edom is the descendants of Esau. Esau and Jacob, that great struggle that there was. And Edom said to him, you shall not pass through my land, lest I come out against you with the sword. And thus we see the beginning of that great struggle between the Edomites and the children of Israel. Ron. Well, this wasn't the only time that the Edomites stood against the children of Israel. In the destruction of Jerusalem by Babylon, we read in Psalm 137, when the children of Israel were hauled off to Babylon, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yea, we wept. When we remembered Zion, we hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it. For there were those who carried us away captive and required a song. And those who plundered us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord a song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her skill. If I do not remember you, let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not extol Jerusalem above my chief joy, remember, O Lord, and this is where it comes to this place. Remember, O Lord, against the sons of Edom. And again, we are standing in the Edomite capital. The day of Jerusalem, who said, raise it, raise it to its very foundations. So the children of Edom... Uh, we're joining forces with the Babylonians in the destruction 
of Jerusalem. One other thing that I want to point from this place here, all along coming in, there is this water trough that comes from a place called Wadi Musa, the spring of Moses. It is the traditional place where they say that Moses struck the rock and the water came out. So here we are in the wilderness of Edom on the other side of Israel. So here we are, standing in the treasury of Petra. Again, you saw this on Indiana Jones, The Last Crusade. It's an amazing sight here, but the Bible talks about Petra, not only in a past tense, but also in a future tense. It says in Jeremiah chapter 49, that in verse 17, Edom shall be an astonishment. And right back here is the sea that we just walked through. And if you, if when you come out and you first see this great sight here, it is an astonishment to everyone. Everybody always goes, <gasps> as they come through here. It's absolutely amazing. In Isaiah chapter 34, it says, for my sword shall be bathed in heaven, and indeed it shall come down on Edom. And again, this is the capital. Petra is the capital of it. In Isaiah chapter 16, it says, Send the lamb to the ruler of the land of the rock Petra. Uh, and that's Selah, Petra, right here. To the mountain of the daughter of Zion, for it shall be as a wandering bird thrown off the nest, so shall the daughters of Moab be at the fords of Arnon. So again, we're experiencing something that may never happen again. We're here all alone here in Petra. I have a friend. <laughs> Well, now I want to start taking you to the future and the prophecies. One of the most amazing prophecies in the Bible is out of the book of Daniel. And when we look in the book of Daniel, we see a number of nations that are going to rise. First, in Daniel chapter 2, we have this great statue, and it begins with a head of gold. The head of gold was that of the Babylonian kingdom. Then it had the chest and the arms of silver, two arms, the Medo-Persian Empire that arose after that. Then it had the belly and the thighs that were brass. That was Alexander the Great's kingdom. And then we get into two legs. The two legs are the Roman Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire and the Western Roman Empire. We in the West tend to forget that after the fall of Rome, the Eastern empires lived another thousand years. Uh, its capital was Constantinople. Then we go down to the uh, feet of clay and iron mixed together. And the Bible here tells us, and as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay. The amazing thing, that word mixed in the Hebrew is Arab. So that is the Sunni Shia kingdoms that we see today. Now as we go on in the book of Daniel, that was from man's view. God's view was that of ravenous beast. First we had a lion and that was the Babylonian kingdom. Then we had another beast, a bear, which was raised up on its side and that's the Medo-Persian Empire. After this the leopard, Alexander the Great, uh, just conquered the world in lightning speed and after that it was a beast that was so terrible that no one could even describe it. And that beast, as we read in the book of Revelation, would suffer a mortal wound and then rise again. So out of the Roman Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire, would arise this mighty Islamic Caliphate nation. And it would rule all of the Middle East from the 600s. For nearly 1,400 years it would rule. It came to a close in 1923, and as that ended up happening, 
then uh, everything was broke apart here in the Middle East. What we see now with the rise of ISIS and their desire for an Islamic caliphate is that coming back to us. Now when we get to the book of Revelation, we see these beasts again. And one of the things that it's important to remember, as it says in Revelation chapter 13, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horn ten crowns, and on his head a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, now, from John's perspective in the book of Revelation, we're looking at a reverse. The closest one there, Alexander the Great, uh, the Greek Empire, and the feet of a bear, the Medo-Persian Empire, and his mouth was a, like the mouth of a lion. And what we see today, from all the way in Pakistan, there was a city called Alexandria. That's where Alexander the Great's kingdom went. It went all the way through that part of the world. The Medo-Persian Empire did, the uh, Greek uh, kingdom did, the Babylonian kingdom did. And so as we look at that, it's all laying down the prophecy of future events. So here we are in this marvelous city of Petra. And look at this. And we've seen coliseums all over the world, but you've never seen one like this. It is carved out of solid rock. So this all would have been uh, one mountain here, and it's all carved out. These places all around here and behind us here, those were homes. Now we're in the residential area of Petra. What we see here in Petra is only one-tenth of what there is. This was a metropolis. Even the writer Josephus talks about the metropolis of Petra. And it's so amazing because we happen to be here all by ourselves this morning uh, before any tourists have been able to come. Well, here we are. We're in Petra, the city of stone. The Red Rose City, half as old of time. The prophet Daniel gives to us in Daniel chapter 9. He says, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the reign, I understood by the books, the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord given through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. Then I set my face toward the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplication with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said, O Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and those who keep his commandments, we have sinned and we have committed iniquity. Daniel understood by the books, by the prophet Jeremiah, the days in which he lived in, and my friends, we too can understand by this book, the Holy Bible, the scriptures of truth, the days that we live in. Daniel gives in chapter 9 one of the most amazing prophecies in all of scripture. It says 70 weeks. Now we as Americans and most of the world do dates by decades. We have the 60s and we have the 70s. But Israel, and biblically, from the very beginning, was never dictated by decades. It was by something that was called a Shabua. It was the sevens. And for instance, you had six days, and then you had the seventh day, the, uh, the uh, Sabbath rest. The same thing with the land. The land was to be uh, plowed for six years. On the seventh year, the Shemitah, it was to be left fallow. So every time it says weeks, it is Shabuah. It is a period of seven years. Seventy Shabuahs, weeks, are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. And then he gives one of the most amazing dates in prophecy, 
Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until the Messiah, the Prince, there will be seven Shabuahs and 62 Shabuahs. So that brings 69 periods of seven years, which equates out to 483 years, or 100,073, 173,000, excuse me, 880 days. And that brings you to a date because we know the date that Artaxerxes gave the command to go forth and rebuild Jerusalem. And that, uh, that, is, that date is one of the most amazing dates. It's March 14th, 445 BC, which would bring when the Messiah would come to April 3rd, AD 33, the day that Jesus would come into the city of Jerusalem. And if you remember, when Jesus came into the city and they were all hailing him as the Messiah and throwing their palm branches and their cloaks on the road and, and shouting, this is the day that the Lord has made. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And Jesus stops and weeps. And he said, if you, even you, would know on this your day the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. And he foretold the terrible destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Now the scripture goes on to say, and the Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. Obviously, Jesus died for our sins. And it goes on, and the people of the prince who is to come. That's the Antichrist. Who is it that destroyed the city of Jerusalem? It was Titus. And Titus had with him the 10th legion. The people from the 10th legion were Turkey, Syria, Petra, this place here, the Nabataean people. It was also uh, Eastern Turkey and Syria, the, the 15th legion, the 12th legion, and the 5th legion, Serbia and Bulgaria. So what I want you to see is that all the forces are Muslim nations today. The prince who is to come. And the scripture goes on, he shall confirm a covenant with many for one Shabua. In Islam, there's something that's called a hunda. A hunda is a peace accord that is signed that they never intend to agree with. And in Muslim theology, they have this for the last days as well. With the sons of Aaron, one that lasts for seven years, exactly what the Bible says, because Satan is the great counterfeiter. And it says, but in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to the sacrifice and offering. And on the wings of abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is poured out on the desolate. Now, my friends, this is a specific thing that Jesus is going to refer to in the Gospel of Matthew. The abomination of desolation. It's going to happen where this coming world leader who will be at first hailed as a Messiah and will be hailed as someone great will bring peace. And let me tell you, standing here in the Middle East, I can guarantee you people want peace. Mm -hmm. and, and especially in Israel who is surrounded on all sides. Jordan, where we are now, is surrounded by five different countries as well that these people who have known war after war after war would love to have peace. And this coming world leader is going to bring a peace accord which will enable the Jews to rebuild their temple. When we were in Jerusalem, we went to the Temple Mount Institute. They have uh, the altar of golden incense. They have the menorah. Uh, they have the table of showbread. They have the high priestly garments. They want 
a temple rebuilt. And in fact, the day we left Jerusalem, the rabbi that was heading that up, was there was an attempted assassination on him who wants to rebuild the temple up there. But there is going to come a world leader who does this. Now, Jesus in Matthew chapter 24 is giving to us the end of the age. And I specifically want to deal with in Matthew chapter 24, verse number 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Mm. That is a direct prophecy from Daniel chapter 9. And it goes on. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. And I want to tell you, this is what is key to where we are today. I have been all over Israel. There are no mountains that are inaccessible anywhere in Israel. And again, it says Judea. It's not talking about people who live in Southern California or Southern France. It specifically says, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on his housetop not come down and take anything out of his house. Let him who is in the field not go back and get his clothes. And again, all over in Israel, people live on their roofs. The land is very expensive. It is tight quarters everywhere. So lots of people have terraces on their roof. But woe to those who are pregnant and those with nursing babies in those days. Because it is going to be a treacherous run. And pray that your flight may not be in winter. Again, when it snows, and it actually snows here in Petra as well, it is absolutely uh, terrible to get around. Uh, same thing with Jerusalem. For then there will be such great tribulation as not been seen since the beginning of the world. Until this time, no, nor shall ever be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be saved. We recently saw something very similar to this in Iraq. The people that were in the path of ISIS fled to a mountain. And there they were safe. And again, between us and Israel, and Israel's often this way, look at all of these rugged mountains that are here. It is this way all the way down to the Dead Sea. The thing about this place is that all of these places are built out of solid rock. Now, one of the things that we have to understand, this comes in the middle of the Great Tribulation. When you read what has taken place in the first half of the Great Tribulation, all of the amazing catastrophes that have taken place, imagine the power grid being knocked out. Imagine all over the world. It, it talks about a third of the ship sinking. How is oil transported all around the world? It's, it's transported by uh, ships. It talks about massive earthquakes taking place all over the world. What happens to all the oil pipelines and there are the power lines that there are. And imagine our world without electricity. Mm. Then all of a sudden, the computers don't work. I'm pretty sure not one of those planes flies without a computer. <laughs> and so, as we see the catastrophic events of the end of the age, because the Bible does say that the armies are on horseback. <laughs> and so, as we look at this, could this be the place that the Bible talks about? Jesus himself, he makes it very special, very clear to the Jews to flee to the mountains. Mm -hmm. Now, in the book of Revelation, we have the exact same description. In Revelation chapter 12, beginning in verse number 1, Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and twelve stars. Well, we, that description of Israel comes from Joseph's dream there in the book of Genesis. 
Then being with child, she cried out in labor and pain to give birth. That child is the Messiah. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his head. And his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven. When Satan rebelled against God, a third of the angels were in that. That's the demonic forces that we have today. And he threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman. The woman is Israel, who was ready to give birth and devour her child as soon as it was born. And if you remember, King Herod from the Iumedan line, which comes from Edom right here where we are, it all comes back together here, tried to massacre and did massacre all the baby boys that were in Bethlehem two years and younger. God had warned Joseph in a dream to flee to Egypt. Now it goes on. And she bore a male child who was to rule all the nations. And that was the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, Jesus, who we worship. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Now here again in verse number 6 of Revelation chapter 12. Then the woman, and the woman is Israel, fled to the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. That is the last half of the Great Tribulation. 1,260 days is 42 months. It's three and a half years. It's times, times, and a half time. The Bible describes this in many different places. So could this be the place where the Jews are going to flee from the wrath of this coming Antichrist, who I unequivocally believe is Islamic, and come, because in the Quran it says there it, the trees and the rocks will cry out. There is a, a Jew behind me, come and kill him. And again, we have to understand something in Islam. Their, their goal is world domination by the sword and force conversion to Islam. What is it that Satan has always wanted? Why is it that he rebelled? He wanted worship. And so here we are in this amazing place that between us and Israel are rugged mountains. The only way through would be on, on foot to be able to get here. Mm -hmm. And again, in the midst of the Great Tribulation, it's going to be an entirely different world than the world that we see today. In Zechariah chapter 12, it says, And the burden of the word of the Lord against Israel. Thus says the Lord, who stretches out the heavens and lays the foundation of the earth and forms the spirit of man within him. Behold, I'll make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day that I'll make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all the peoples. For all who will heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all the nations of the earth are gathered against it. There is no more disputed property in the entire world than is what the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. There is the Dome of the Rock, which is the Muslims' third most holy site. If you've been following the events in Israel, uh, there have been massive riots through Jerusalem uh, because of the events on the Dome of the Rock and the Jews wanting to go back there and pray. And Muslims don't want to even acknowledge that the Jews ever had Jerusalem. This is why, my friends, of all the countries in the world, there is only one city where the American embassy is not in the capital. Do you realize that? Of all the cities in the world, our embassy in, in Russia, it's in Moscow. In Great Britain, it's in London. But in Israel, it should be in, in Jerusalem. They own land in Jerusalem. You can see the blank piece of land that they own there, but our embassy is in Tel Aviv. Why? 
because Tel Aviv, or I mean Jerusalem, is a disputed city. The Arabs, uh, the Palestinians want that as their capital. And it's one of the whole sticking points. And again, the Bible is very clear. It will not go well with any nation that tries to divide the city of Jerusalem. And it is a warning to the United States of America. And I believe John Kerry is over there. Maybe he'll listen to my tape tonight. But anyway, (laughs) it is a severe warning. Even if all the nations of the world come against Jerusalem. And in that day, I will strike every horse with confusion and its rider with madness. I will open my eyes on the house of Judah, and I will strike every horse of the people with blindness. Again, I think it's very important to understand, by the time of the end of the tribulation, all kinds of catastrophic events have taken place. So the idea of civilized life as we have it with electricity and all of that is It just isn't going to be that way. That's why the Bible's talking about uh, up to the horse's bridle. It always talks about these last days in events of horses. And again, as I've gone through Israel this time and actually drove all the way down the valley, that Jordan Valley, past the Dead Sea, and that land that separates Israel, Israel from Jordan, Moab today, the Edomites today, this is the only place that makes sense where anybody could flee to and actually have a natural fortification of safety. Now, I haven't been there for a few years, but I want to tell you what they're doing. This narrow canyon that comes in called a Sikh and and through parts of it, aren't much wider than the aisle here, you know, and for the most part of it, it's no wider than one section of chairs here. It goes up 300 places. In this narrow seek, there are other canyons that go off. What they've done and what the Nabataeans had done, they walled up all of those other canyons. So when it rained, they all filled up with water. Every one of those new dams that they're building right now, they have water spigots at the bottom of it. So as it rains, there'll be a natural reservoir to be able to carry water. Now, the Islamic teaching is very interesting because in Islamic teaching, uh, the last days of which Islam believes that they too are in the last days, The only difference in their teaching and our teaching is their good guy is our Antichrist. And they believe at the end of the age, there'll be a false Messiah come back to help the Jews. Well, that who is that that comes back to help the Jews at the end of the age? It's Jesus Christ. We read it here in Zechariah chapter 12, verse number 10. And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace. And they will look on me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son, and grieve for him as one grieves for his firstborn. The Bible tells us that all of Israel will be saved. In, in the book of Romans in chapter 10. In Zechariah chapter 13, it says in verse number 6, And someone will say to him, What are these wounds in your hands? And then he'll answer, Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. The Jews are going to look on the returning Jesus and see the nail prints in, their hand, in his hands and realize that Jesus was their Messiah all along. Now, there have been terrible holocausts against the Jews in the, in the history, but the worst is yet to come. It's found in Zechariah chapter 13, 8, and it shall come to pass in all the land, says the Lord, that two thirds in it shall be cut off and die. And then in Zechariah chapter 14, 
the battle for Jerusalem. And behold, the day of the Lord is coming, and your spoil will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. The city shall be taken, the houses rifled, the women ravished. Half of the city shall go into captivity, but the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. I want to ask you a question. What happens when ISIS overruns a village? What happens to the inhabitants of that village? Well, let me tell you. The men are tortured. Their heads are cut off. Their wives are raped. Their children are taken as sex slaves. And the women and children are sold in public auction. Where did they get that idea from? Muhammad. That's jihad. That's how Islam came to strength. It's interesting. The guy that was there on uh, the tour with me, he was a Muslim. His name was Muhammad. Great young guy. Uh, Actually, he was 38 years old. His wife also died of cancer. So we had a lot in common. We had lots of conversations. And very honest because we had long bus rides and he and I, we didn't argue, but He is a devout Muslim. Uh, I'm obviously a devout Christian. He'd ask me questions. I'd ask him questions. But you see, unfortunately, our government has never understood something. All these people in this region are tribal. You know, we try to make nations. Afghanistan isn't a nation. It's made of all different kinds of tribes. Afghanistan, is, uh, Iraq, what's the problem in Iraq? You always had the Sunni and the Shia and all the differences that they have. All these different tribes. All of Jordan is a tribe or different tribes. And so our brand of government doesn't work at all. Because number one, Islam doesn't even recognize governments because Shia law trumps every constitution that is there. So unfortunately, much of our actions have been misguided because we thought, you know, it'd be like after World War II, we'd go in and help Germany rebuild and they would become a democracy. You can't do that in an Islamic nation. And what we see today with the rise of ISIS, you have to understand, because we don't know history, but they do. For 1,400 years, an Islamic caliphate centered in Turkey ruled the entire Middle East. And it wasn't until after World War I that that failed because they went on the side of Germany and they were defeated. And thus France took Lebanon and Syria and England took Egypt and they just divided up, made arbitrary countries, put dictators in those countries. And that's how it was for a long time. But my friends, all of that is changing. And one of the things that we have to do is understand this from not a Western mindset, but from a Middle Eastern mindset. Why is ISIS growing in power and influence? Because it's saying we are reestablishing the Islamic caliphate that doesn't recognize Syria. That was a Western made country to begin with. It doesn't recognize Iraq. It doesn't recognize these nations. In fact, it erases all of these borders. And again, there are motivations to make this happen. Because whatever they conquer, they get to keep. They get to keep the women, the children, the goods, the homes of the Christians, of the oldest Christian communities in the world. What did they mark them with? An inn for Nazarene. And they've confiscated them and they've taken them to be their own. So you know what you got? You got lots of young men all over in the Middle East saying, I'm going to join ISIS so I can get in on the booty. 
And you see the description here in the book of, Rev, or, uh, book of Zechariah. But then in Zechariah chapter 14, it says, Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faced Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will be split in two. Now, if you'd like, turn with me to Revelation chapter 19. Fortunately, we've been given the final score. We know how this battle is going to turn out. And in Revelation chapter 19, Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. And he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations." And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. And he himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. My friends, when I see people getting beheaded on Facebook, when I see children being auctioned off as sex slaves, When I see the oldest Christian communities in the world being massacred, I can't wait for Jesus to come back. And I want to tell you, when he comes back, he's coming back with the fierceness of the winepress of the wrath of Almighty God. I want to ask you a question. In the book of Revelation, what is the method of those who do not submit to the Antichrist of their execution? It is beheading. I want to tell you in 1 John chapter 2, the Bible says this, you'll recognize the Antichrist because he will deny the Father and the Son. In Islam, there is no greater sin than to say that God is a father or that Jesus Christ is a son. In the Dome of the Rock, it's that blasphemy is written in Arabic around the inside of it. I've seen it with my own eyes in the days at which we could go in there. But you have to understand that's exactly what's happening. The, the, all these young men that you see, these terrorists, Have you noticed there's always something that's exactly the same about them? They have a headband tied around their head. On that headband is their allegiance. It says, there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. Five times a day all over the world, Muslims bow down and pray and worship Allah. What is it that Satan has always desired? He has always desired to be worshipped. And when you realize, you know what Islam means? Submission. That's what it means. And here's how it works. Islam takes you over. They give you an invitation to convert. If you refuse to convert, either you are allowed to live by paying a tax, or they take off your head. And what's happening, we're seeing this all ratcheting up more and more and more because of their successes. And the more successes that they have, the quicker this is all going to happen. You need to watch Turkey. Turkey is not our friend. And Turkey will emerge as a leader throughout all this chaos. And I know it's very calm. Uh, complex with the Shias who are based in Iran. They have a different form of Islam than the Sunnis, which are based in Saudi Arabia and Jordan. 
Syria is divided. Turkey has some divided. And so they're fighting each other. And we, we can't figure out what on earth is going on. But you have to understand the Bible describes it. They're mixed. They're partly strong. And yet there's partly fragile. But it's going to end up and center there in Turkey. You mark my words and you watch it. But I got great news. Jesus is coming back. And the Bible says in verse 16, and he has on his robe and in his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And then I saw an angel standing in the sun and he cried with a loud voice saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, come fly and gather or come and gather together for the great supper of God that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and the flesh who sat on them, and the flesh of all the people, free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. You have to understand, in the teaching of Islam, there is a false prophet. They believe in Jesus. They don't believe in the same Jesus you and I believe in. They believe that Jesus was a a prophet and that he did not die on the cross, that he ascended into heaven. And some Muslims believe it was Judas who died on the cross, that his visage was changed to look like Jesus and he was crucified. And that this Jesus, this Muslim Jesus called Isis, will return in the middle of the seven-year peace plan that they make with the sons of Aaron. This is Islamic theology for the last days. It is a counterfeit, is exactly opposite as the biblical account. This false Jesus will return in the middle of that, and he will tell all the Jews and the Christians that they were wrong all along. My friends, you look at the pictures of when they're having their mass demonstrations. So often you're going to see them with one finger pointing in the sky. There is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. There is a hatred. They talk all the time about breaking every single cross. There is a hatred not only for the Jews, but there is a hatred for Christianity. And I believe we will begin seeing things in our own country of lone wolf attacks. Just like we've already seen happen in different isolated things of someone going berserk and just attacking people, cutting their heads off. Until hopefully one day we wake up to the realization that Islam is not a religion. It is a political ideology of world domination. And until our governments wake up to that fact, we're going to experience lots and lots of trouble. But... They also teach that at the end, a false Jesus will come back to help the Jews. That's why we see here in the book of Revelation, they make war against Jesus coming back. Really? Are you serious? Because they've already been duped to believe it. But let's see what happens. The beast was captured and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image. And these two were cast alive into the lake of the burning fire with brimstone. And the rest were killed with a sword, which proceeds from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. And then chapter 20, we see Satan bound for a thousand years. At the end of that time, we see the final judgment of God Revelation chapter 21, we see a new heaven and a new earth. And in Revelation chapter 22, the last words that we have to us, 
He who testifies to these things say, I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Amen. So, as I shared, I went all the way through Israel again. Spent lots of time in Jordan. There's really only one place that makes any sense for the Jews to do what Jesus told them to do in the middle of the great tribulation at the abomination of desolation. And that's to flee to these mountains that are in Jerusalem. And so my friends, where does that leave us? Where does that leave us in these days? I believe we live in the most exciting period in the history of mankind. The Bible says that people's hearts will fail them for fear. But my friends, that's not what Jesus has told us to do, is it? He's told us that when you begin to see these things come to pass, look up because your redemption draws near. My friends, we have the answer to what on earth is happening. And we know the place to where it is all going. And that's why, my friends, we have been called to be bright, shining lights in the midst of a dark and a perverse world. But this is no time, my friends, to be falling asleep. And this is no time, my friends, to be turning our heart away from the Lord. This is no time to be getting drunk and shacking up with people that you're not married to. This is a time to be ready for the Lord's return and proclaiming the truth and the hope for the world is Jesus Christ.